going to be talking about managing Python package dependencies and like a note in the subscript, constant problems are not a requirement. You have a lot of things that are requirements in Python packages, but really the problems we tend to keep getting over and over with them, we don't need to be doing that. For some context here, how many of you maintain a Python package? Okay, so about like maybe five, seven of you. How many of you use Python packages in a project that isn't itself a Python package? Okay, quite a few more there. Um, how many of you aren't really even familiar with Python packaging and would like just kind of like an overview of like how it works? Don't be shy. Okay, we've got a few of those too. Well, I think I've got all of you covered here. There's, we're gonna start with sort of an overview of the kinds of problems you can hit with packaging and then get into some details of the ecosystem and start with recommendations on how we can overcome some of the problems that all of you mentioned. So a bit about myself, I'm Jeremy Bowman. I work here at edX, just downstairs about in this corner. And I'm a principal software engineer here. I work on the tools team. Uh, the tools team, what we do is actually work on things to improve developer productivity. So we manage, maintain our test suite, the infrastructure our tests to run on, and other scripts and utilities for helping developers get their job done you know, more effectively. And so I spend a lot of time looking at things like, okay, We've done, we've hit the same problem four times now. How can we not hit that again? What can we automate to make sure we don't waste another half day finding out what that problem was and then realizing, oh, we've done this before and then applying the fix we already knew how to do. Um, packaging looks on the surface of it pretty simple. Uh, you have a setup.py file which has the metadata about a Python package and it has in it this little line that says install requires and you list the packages you depend on. That looks straightforward. It's like, okay, well, I use this and this, done. But there's also a setup of CFG file, and it can also have an install requires. And, okay, so when do I use that versus a setup.py? Do I use both? Can I use one or the other? Does it matter? And then a lot of packages have this requirements.txt in it, or something like that. Maybe sometimes the requirements directory full of text files. And that also lists like the dependencies. And now there's versions on them, and there's inequalities and equalities. And this first one, okay, you know, a mathematician or an engineer, that looks really odd. <laughs> Django is greater than or equal to 1.11, which is less than 2.0. Well, I'm guessing that Django is supposed to be in the middle of that. Um, and then why is the Django an inequality, but the PyTZ is pinned to an exact version? Was there a reason for that? Were they just done different times by different people? It's kind of hard to tell at first glance. And then, it can get really out of hand. So this is ipython setup.py, and this isn't even all of it, it scrolls off the bottom here. And there's this extra require thing, and there's all these different things in different contexts, and there's install requires, and they have versions, and you scroll down here, my mouse is working for me, um, there's more extra require things, and suddenly it's looking at the Python version, it's looking at Form we're running on, and there's conditionals in here, and what is all of this? So it's not quite as simple as it looked at first glance. Um, but okay, I don't have to worry about that. I'm yeah, really basic guys. So I'll say I have a Django application, and I need two things. I have Django, and I use social auth app Django to handle logins from various social services like Facebook and Twitter and such. That shouldn't cause any problems. No, I should be done. Oh. Right, my service is still using Python 2.7 and the latest version of Django is 2.06, which only works with Python 3, so it blows up if I try to install it. Okay, well, I saw that to the inequalities for, I can fix that. So, just until I finish my port to Python 3, I can put in that, okay, well, Django has to be less than version 2.0 when they drop support for Python 2. Shouldn't be problems with that. Oh, I heard from someone that's there not constrained by this issue I have of running on Python 2. They're using uh, the latest version of Django with Python 3, and they'd like to use my app, but I've just made it impossible because they can't install it uh, if you have a newer version of Django installed. And some joker contacted me and said, <laughs> they're still using Django 1.2. I have no interest whatsoever in supporting that. I don't want to imply that I support that. So I'll clarify this a little more. So in my setup.py, I'm going to restrict them to only using Django versions higher than 1.8, but I'm going to remove the top limit. And okay, here I can kind of see why I need the requirements file. 
So in what I'm doing development, I want to make sure that I'm using one of the Django versions that works for my service. Um, but like, I'm not restricting anybody from using a newer version of Django. Ah, OK, I think I've solved the problem now. And then a few weeks later, a new version of social app, app Django comes out that breaks backwards compatibility, and my app suddenly, the tests start failing, even though I didn't make any code changes. If I'm running my tests on a routine basis, or I'm just making an unrelated bug fix, I suddenly have to diagnose why did this thing break, and now do I put a fix in the same pull request as the code I was working on? Do I stop and fix that first and then come back to what I was trying to do? I really didn't want to deal with that at the moment. So, um, yeah, okay, so fine, I'll restrict the version to be less than that, and in my requirements, I'll just pin all of my dependencies to the exact versions I'm using in my service so that they definitely won't upgrade unexpectedly on me. That'll definitely cover. And then social op core gets a new version. I didn't even depend on social op core. Wait a minute. It turns out that social op app Django itself depends on social op core. Setup up high was automatically installing it for me. I didn't even notice it, so I didn't pin it because I forgot it was even there. So fine. I'll do a pip freeze. I'll list all of the dependencies of my application, and I'll put down all the exact versions of everything in the requirements file. And I'll just restrict what I have to in the setup.py. But again, like other people can use whenever they're going to. But for my development, I'm using the exact versions. And then about a year later, if I haven't had to work on this for a while, it hasn't been tested with a recent version of any of its dependencies. So someone who goes off to use it in their new project is like, hey, your project just doesn't work. It's broken. Nothing functions. I did a fresh install, and it's completely busted. It's because you haven't been testing with any of these newer releases of things, which anybody starting a new project using the app is likely going to have. Uh, it can be a lot easier than this. And it doesn't, you don't have to hit all these problems. There are actually tools that help you work around this. There are practices that you, know, you can avoid this. The important thing is in the Python ecosystem, it doesn't really, it's not really explained up front that you have to do this. Uh, you get random pieces of information about like, these different components of the cover in a bit. I'm sorry, I'm confused on one point. If you use pip freeze to pin all the dependencies to specific versions, yep. why would a year later anything have changed? Because, well, that's the thing. <laughs> For your tests, nothing has changed. The tests still pass. But someone using your application in their own project, even though if they download the application and run its tests, the tests will pass. If they use it in their project, which got the newer versions of these dependencies, it's not going to work because it's made backwards compatibility breaking changes in one or more of these packages. So I'm going to take some time to go over and explain the different pieces of the dependencies puzzle in Python. So especially for those of you who are like a little newer to this and maybe missed some pieces I was just mentioning now, I'm going to talk a little bit about what these different things are, a little bit of the background on why they exist, and how they fit together. And then by the end of it, you start to see, like, OK, well, here's some tools we can use to start trying to resolve this. Um, first up, disutils. This is almost irrelevant, but I think it's still worth a mention. It, these are the legacy utilities for building Python packages. This is actually part of the standard library that comes with Python. And it was the original source of all the code that worked with setup.py, where you would define your package and you would run python setup.py sdist, and it builds a source distribution of your Python package. Um, it says outright in the documentation for distributed seals, even in Python 2, don't use this. Use setup tools instead. Uh, setup tools is a separate package, which we'll talk about in a moment, that was sort of born out of the limitations of distutils. Um, and just setup tools still uses parts of distutils, which is part of why I bring this up. Also, if you do a, a Google or DuckDuckGo search or whatever, looking for information about the syntax of setup.py, sometimes it'll take you to the standard library distutils page, and you need to know that you should probably just ignore that and go straight to the setup tools documentation or the Python user packaging guide. So setup tools. Uh, this is a toolkit for defining and building Python packages. Uh, it is a package on PyPI. This actually does not come with Python. Part of the reason for that is deliberate, because they make changes and updates and fixes the packaging relatively often. If it was part of Python, you wouldn't be able to 
fix packaging issues without upgrading your entire pipeline at one time. And they didn't want to restrict people in that way. So it'll work with any, the latest version of SetUpTools works with any still supported version of Python, even Python 2.7. Um, and SetUpTools is where the, the, the syntax for setup.py and setup.cfg are really defined. That's where you go for documentation over uh, actually using these files and what to put into them and so forth. So setup.py tends to look something like this. You have a you know, Python file and you know, from setup tools import a couple things. So you can see we're using setup tools. And you have the setup method and function. And it has metadata. It has the name of the package, what version it is, who created it, some information about them. Uh, this find packages thing for, I guess, finding the packages inside your package. There's some unfortunate you know, recursive nomenclature there. And down here, you see near the bottom, there's an install requires, which lists a dependency. Okay, so like setup.py has something to do with dependency management, like we saw before. This is the part of the package description that says, in order to run correctly, this package needs these other packages to be installed. And that's why it's install and requires. So when you install this package, it's going to do a check to see are those things in the Python environment you're installing it into? And if not, it's going to complain at you that this isn't going to work. Um, so <coughs> things to note about setup.py. It is Python code. It is not markup. If you want to do some tooling to like, look through a set of packages and get some information about them, say their author or what version of Python they support or whatever, you can't really get it without either running it, which usually builds a package or does something else odd, or like doing some fancy things with uh, graph and regular expressions trying to pluck out the bits you want, which is a little inconvenient. Um, it contains some information you need to change pretty often. Notice it has a version number in there. So every time you're releasing a new version of your package, unless you take some extra steps, you're going to have to go in and change this file. Anytime your dependencies change, uh, your, your drop support for older version, you're going to have to go in there and change it. So setup.py in a typical project gets updated a lot. And also, because it is Python code, it tempts you into trying to do clever things. Um, when you go in and you hit a packaging problem, one of the first thing people, things people think of is, oh, well, it's just Python code. I can put a condition in that if I'm on this operating system, then do this. And you end up with monstrosities like the IPython setup that I showed you earlier. So there's an alternative. This is something that uh, the setup.cfg file has existed for a while. It served other purposes before, which I'm not going to get into right now. But the main point in, I want to make in this context is it's an alternative since late December of 2016, I think the release was, uh, to using setup.py for putting in all the metadata about a package. You can put it in this INI format text file instead of using the Python syntax. And so here we have metadata about a package and down here under options, you see we have still install requires and what you mentions the package it depends on. And note the names are pretty similar, so it's not much of a stretch to go from setup.py to setup.cfg. And for a lot of cases, this is going to be like, better for like, tooling and automation and such. But for a simple package maintenance, maybe it doesn't matter, you can use either one. But just know that this is a newer development and there are reasons to switch to it. Um, there are also notes here. For so the version number, it didn't specify the version number. It has this little file indicator, and it gives a path to a file to fetch the version number from. That's something that you can easily do in the Python setup.py file, but here it actually gives you a clean, straightforward way of doing it instead of everyone having to write their own code for you know, how do you parse out the content of a text file and pluck it into a field on your setup file. So things to note about the setup.cfg file. Uh, as I said, it's a relatively recent addition to setup tools. That's why you don't see it everywhere and why a lot of the more popular packages don't use it because it was set a long time ago and they just haven't bothered to switch. Um, it was inspired by other projects such as PBR, which did this kind of thing with setup.cfg before, and they decided it was a good idea and they moved it into the mainstream packaging utilities. Uh, it uses a standard INI format. There's a lot of parsers for this. This is one that comes with the Python standard library. It's a relatively easy format to work with. Uh, you can parse it without running it. That has obvious advantages. Um, you still need a setup.py if you're using setup.cfg, but you need very little in it. Basically, you just need to import the setup function and call it. You don't really need to pass it any parameters. Setup tools will know to go and find it in this file instead. 
and as I said, it has some utilities for loading, you know, loading content from a file, from an attribute of, so for example, say a version number in your uh, module init uh, mod file, you can just plug, plug out from there. Um, it's not code, so it can't handle some form of pieces. If you find yourself needing some really complicated things about knowing what system it's building on and so forth, you might still have to resort to a set of that file, but you can use a combination of the two. I'd be careful about though that though because then you're going to confuse yourself, thinking you're looking at the entire configuration and you have a whole other world of it all being made file. So generally try to stick to one of them. So there are all these different. I mentioned set install requires before, but there are all these different parameters being passed into either setup.py or setup.cfg. There's setup requires. Dependencies that you need before you can even build your package, let alone install it. If your setup.py script uses and imports some code that has to be in the vir your virtual environment, you need to list it here. Generally, it's not a good idea to do that, but it's there in case you need to. Install requires, we already talked about, that's what you need for your package to work. Tests require, any additional dependencies you need to run the tests for your package. This was Primarily designed for Python setup.py test, which in the olden days was the primary way people ran tests for the packages. This is not so popular anymore, partially because it puts you a lot of limitations on you and you have to go through the setup tools framework. I wouldn't worry about this too much, but you will see it on a lot of packages because in the old days, this is how you ran your tests. And extras require has additional requirements for optional features. So if you have something that doesn't have Django as a core requirement, but if you use Django, then it has some additional functionality. You can actually tell, when you say when you're installing the package, give me this package with this optional set of features, and it will make sure that you have the packages you need for that. Again, not something that most packages need that often, but it's there for all the cases. And just to make things confusing, there is Python requires, which isn't a list of package dependencies at all. It is a text string which specifies what Python versions are supported by this particular package. And specifically in order to build the package. Uh, just to be confusing. Environment markers. This is something that even a lot of senior Python people I've talked to aren't that familiar with because it's a relatively recent addition to the Python packaging ecosystem. I think this has been around for maybe two or three years now. So, these constrain when a dependency is required. So you can say, I have this package that I need to install if I am on Python 2, but if I'm Python 3, there's something in the standard library that's equivalent, so I don't need it. Or I have this, I'm on, when I'm on Mac, I need this package to be installed in order to get read line capability equivalent to what Linux has by default, but it won't you know, work if I install it on Linux, and things like this. So in your setup.py requirements or in setup.cfg, you can put in this colon after the dependency, and then there's a set of things you can put in to specify that you have some additional constraints on when that package is actually needed. I'm not going to go into the detail of syntax for this. It's a best talk all in and of itself, but know it exists. There are PIPs for it. There is minimal documentation in setup tools and some documentation in PIP about it. They both do fully support it, though, in recent versions. Uh, if you have a really old version of set of tools or PIP, you may need to upgrade it to take advantage of this or to use packages that do take advantage of it. And so this other thing, PIP, I've been talking about for a while now. This is a utility for installing and uninstalling Python packages. Uh, it is also a package on PyPI. It does not come with Python, although recent versions of Python 3 at least come with a utility that allow you to easily get it because it's pretty much assumed now for any non-trivial Python project that you're going to need PIP in order to install packages, because although Setup Tools has functionality for doing that, it's a terrible idea to use it. They don't recommend doing that anymore. For one thing, it makes uninstalling things very difficult, whereas PIP, it's easy to get a list of what you've installed and you can remove it, it just works. Uh, you can install an individual package, like PIP install Django, or you can install all of the dependencies in your file, pip install dash r requirements of text. Now that requirements text file we saw earlier is making some sense. You have a list of your dependencies that PIP is using, and it's completely separate from what Setup Tools is looking at. Setup Tools does not care about your requirements you know, to file. When you install the package from PyPI, 
the requirements files, unless you do something clever with your setup.py file, are going to be completely ignored. Um, but this is powerful for a lot of cases when you're using your package and when you're running tests, and we'll see how this comes into play in just a minute. So a requirements file is plain text, but it has a specified format. You can't just put anything you want there or treat it like an essay. You, it has a particular comment syntax. You have to lift format your dependencies in a particular way. Um, the order of the dependencies in the file is unimportant, except for the reader. It's often nice to alphabetize it just so you can find things you can put in it, but it does not install them in the order of the list in the file. Pip is clever and sees that when you've installed <coughs> listed things which are dependencies of each other, it installs the things first that need to be installed in order to get the things that are the higher quality. Um, but it is a text file. That means it can be generated. You can write text files, but also these are very easy to generate by scripts, which has led to some interesting tool. So there's this package called pip tools. And this can basically take a input requirements file, like the one above, say this is the, the requirements for running a test suite in Travis CI for continuous integration. And you say, okay, well, I want CodeCub for reporting my code coverage to a third party service. I want Tox which is a utility for managing multiple virtual environments and run, or run my pack, test my package against different versions of Python or different versions of Django. And then Tox Battery, which is basically filling in a gap in the Tox functionality, which lets it know when the requirements file has changed that it actually needs to update the requirements. And then I run pip compile on it using a command like the one in the common there, and suddenly it lists out all of the packages that are needed in order to get those three packages the exact versions that are available at the time of running it that comply with the constraints in the input file, which in this case there aren't any. And it tells me for each of those dependencies, where did it come from? So I know that because I used CodeCov, it had to pull in coverage and requests. And because I pulled in requests, now I need Certify and Charidat and IDNA, et cetera. So this is kind of nice because that problem that we had back before where we needed to pin everything to exact versions to make sure our tests ran consistently, but then it was a pain to keep it up to date. We had to look when there was a new version, as well, we just didn't bother. Now we can have our hand edited requirements file, which just says, these are the things I need, and then generate this other file that says, these are the things I want to install when I run my tests. And we can actually do this, set something up to make this easy to do and more off, run it more often, and we can now isolate the changes between when I'm deliberately making a change, I just want the test to work the way it did before, and I'm upgrading some stuff, I want to see if that breaks any of the tests. Uh, there are two different packages in pip tools. There's pip compile and pip sync. So pip compile, I've already mentioned before, it generates a comprehensive, fully detailed requirements file from a higher level requirements file. And pip sync will install everything that's in a requirements file and actually uninstall anything that's not in this is what makes it different from just running pip. So if you've been doing a lot of development and you had a bunch of stuff installed, and then you tinker around with it a bit, and then you finally finish your change and put it up, and then it breaks in CI or when someone else installs it, you may have installed something along the way that was still in your environment that wasn't there in the CI or your fellow developer's environment. This will actually fix that because it'll make sure to remove anything that you didn't explicitly say you're still using. Yeah, so pip sync is a tool proves, just for... Proves the crap. Right. Okay. It just makes sure that your current environment where you're running it matches the requirements file or files that you gave it and strip out anything that's not listed there. Um, there is an alternative to uh, pip tools. Uh, pip end is actually getting pretty popular recently. Um, it is kind of a combination of pip compile and virtual end. It both compiles high-level dependencies into more detailed dependencies and manages your Python virtual environments and tries to make it easy to set up a new project and build your first virtual app and so forth. Um, it doesn't use requirements files. It has what's called a pip file and uh, pipfile.lock. And this is something that was a project that was around before pip end but still isn't finalized. There's, there's a lot of sen sentiment that using just text files for requirements is a little misleading because it looks like you can change all things that actually break the syntax or it's not clear how it should be formatted. So they tried coming up with a separate 
uh, file format for this, and that's what pipmd uses. Um, so you have your high-level requirements in pip file, like the pip compile input file, and then pip file.lock is the generated and fully detailed requirements. Uh, it is a very active project. There's been a lot of discussion about this. It's on use PyCon. A lot of people are using it now. Versions of the Python packaging guide actually recommend this as a default choice for managing dependencies. But it has some limitations. It is opinionated like any of the other projects by the same author. And one of these opinions is that you can only have two sets of dependencies. You have the normal dependencies for the package, as in like what set of the Py would have, and you have the dependencies you actually use for development. And that's it. And I work in a lot of projects where we kind of want more than that. There's dependencies you install for building documentation, for running your tests, like the one I showed where in like Travis, you just went enough to run talks, and then inside talks, you're going to have other dependencies. Um, this will work for a lot of packages, especially ones just getting started, but just be aware that it does have some limitations. And because it's a newer project in PIP tools, there are still some bugs in handling certain kinds of input requirements and then generating the block file. Um, it's getting much better, and as I said, this will work for a lot of people, but I'm going to treating it for the time being as an alternative to something that we're using as well. Um, the next thing that is useful is to have a task runner. So I've said that you can use pip compile to generate the output requirements file, but also the command for that was kind of long, and I also mentioned that a lot of the projects that I work on, we have multiple sets of requirements files. So in a lot of the projects that I'm helping develop, we have two different make targets using a make file, one for installing the requirements for a development environment, and another one for uh, updating all the requirements files by generating them in an order. I'll talk in a moment by actually doing it in a particular sequence is important. And this saves you from having to type in all this stuff by hand and makes it very easy to update to the latest pin version of all your dependencies so that you can actually do it more often and don't get that problem of it's been a year since I bothered to check and see if my package works with any of the newer versions of its dependencies. And so when using pip tools and a you know, target this way, a, uh, any kind of a task running target this way, you need to identify which context you actually need to install dependencies in. So some ones I mentioned, just the core dependencies of the package, dependencies for running tests, dependencies for building documentation. If you use Sphinx and upload them to read the docs, that's going to require some packages you probably don't normally need any other time. Um, when you're doing development, things like updating the list of dependencies, you don't really want pip tools installed in production. It doesn't hurt anything, but it's sort of wasting time and resources to do it. Um, each one gets a star.in requirements file, or if you're using pip in, one of those two pip file categories. So you just figure out what these contexts are and identify what your high level requirements are. So, like, like we did back at the beginning, where you have Django and you know, social off Django app. What's the name of the So just those core things that you need. And then basically leave it to either pip compile or pip env to enumerate things specifically. Uh, don't put in version constraints unless you know a particular version is not going to work. So you've hit a bug, you know you can't upgrade yet, you can put in a, a constraint and say, oh, I know this doesn't you did ideally even put a comment in your requirements file saying, this is going to not be upgraded until this issue is resolved. And that makes it clear why these things are limited instead of scratching your head. It's like, why are we using that particular version? And don't list the indirectory dependencies now because, as I said, the other tools do that for you. And ideally use only a single requirements file per context. We've hit issues before where for running tests, it's like, okay, well, tests is the base dependency plus the test dependencies plus this other set of dependencies, and you just run the requirements files one after the other. But then the problem you sometimes have is, well, this requirements file installed this version of the package, and the next one says, well, actually, for the things I'm installing, the version constraints you gave me, that one doesn't work, so I'm going to uninstall that one, install a different one, and it's a little hard to tell, because you say, well, in this requirements file, I said to use that version of that package, but that's not what I actually have in my environment. How did that happen? It's because one of your later files, Pip had to make a decision to override the earlier one and install something different instead of making things work. Uh, it's much easier if you just have a single requirements file that's like, in this context, these are the ver exact versions of everything I'm going to install. 
And there are cases where, as I said in the test case, one context can inherit from another one. If you're running tests, you typically need all of your core dependencies plus the dependencies you need to run tests. But you don't, and there is a, a syntax in requirements files for including the content of another requirements file. You can just have dash r or dash dash requirements and then the name or path to the other file. But you don't want to include the .in files because again, as I said about pip, you know, getting clever and changing versions on you, you could end up with one set of requirements that you use in production, but then due to limits on the testing packages you use, you actually end up showing slightly different versions to test. So your tests aren't accurately reflecting your actual production dependencies that are getting deployed. So instead, you want to include the generated .text file that was output by you know, pip compile and use that as the input to your next dependencies file. And that's why the correct order mattered in that task. So you want to do like your base dependencies and then your test dependencies and then your development dependencies, which is everything you need to run tests plus some global development environment maintenance tools. And so it looks something like this. You have a .in file and it says dash r based off text or whatever the text file is. And give yourself a comment there as to why you're including it. You'll thank yourself later. And I said before about doing clever things in setup.py. I'm going to kind of recommend doing a clever thing in setup.py. If you have a list of your high-level dependencies in setup.py, and you have another list of your high-level dependencies in your input requirements file for pip tools, you're eventually going to forget to update one of them when you update the other. So you can actually, in your setup.py, basically load that requirements file and do functions like this one. So I'm going to put up the slide so if people actually want to use this, they can. And make sure that you get in the exact versions that are in that high level dependencies file. In many cases, this will work. It will break down in some cases. But I think for a lot of projects, this is actually preferable than forgetting to update one of those two cases and having your tests and your actually installed environment pull out of sync. And this actually make, as like I said, because we now have a single task that we can run, like make upgrade or paver upgrade dependencies or whatever, you can now just run that and it'll go through and upgrade everything in all of your requirements files to the latest available version that you didn't specifically restrict down to a lower version. And you want to do this relatively often. If you wait six months to do this, it will update half of your dependencies. And then if something breaks, you'll have no idea where it came from. So this is something that you don't want to leave off until you're doing major work. You want to do this relatively often to catch backwards and compatible changes relatively close to when they happen, and we can just kind of tackle it in isolation. And you want to ideally run this on a schedule. So don't wait until the next time you have to make a change in your package. Maybe it's the package you don't work on very often. You only look at it once every six months. Uh, just let it schedule something, Jenkins, cron, or whatever, to run this task periodically, generate a pull request for you, it'll trigger your continuous integration. You do have continuous integration, right? You're running your tests whenever you make code changes. <laughs> um, and it'll let you know if something broke in your tests. And again, you have test coverage, right? You, you're not just at like 10% test coverage, you actually know if your tests fail. If your tests fail, you know that something's wrong, and you know that if something's wrong, your tests will fail. Uh, these things are important to actually make the strategy work properly. Um, so yeah, run this relatively often, make sure your tests have good coverage, and just keep up with the treadmill as much as you can. And in cases where you can't upgrade something because there's a bug, ticket the bug, make a note for yourself to fix it later, put a comment in the requirements file, and make it a point to come back and actually get it done. Uh, this sort of scratches the surface. There's a lot more advice and sort of Needling details of exactly how to set up these requirements files and what kind of comments to leave for yourself. And this is something we did a whole review process at edX for how to do this. And we wrote up a document called OF18. OF is an open edX enhancement, an open edX proposal. And we have a bunch of documentation and advice in here on using PIP tools with this and some notes on PIP and why we're not using it at the moment. We might change our minds later. 
And there's a lot of advice and recommendations in here that people can look at and see if it works for them and if it helps solve any of the packaging problems you've hit or understand how to avoid some of the issues you've had in the past. And the other thing to note is that, as Ned said before, all of our repositories at edX and the Open edX project are open source. So there are multiple repositories that are now starting to take advantage of these guidelines. We've already updated maybe eight to 10 of them to follow exactly this process. There's some others that use a slightly older version of it, and we're actively updating them to follow this because we don't want to keep hitting the same problems every time that we've run into before. Uh, so feel free to go and take a look at those for advice. Uh, if you see something that looks weird, let us know. We want feedback. If you think of better ways to handle this, I'd love to hear about it. And with that, any questions? here that says let tox control the Django version for tests <laughs> and so what pip compile does is like I said it pins everything in the dependence file in the requirements files which means that as you said if you're running in tox when you have different tox environments for different versions of Django that you want to run it would end up always installing that one version or conflict with if you try to set another one in the tox.ini file so what we do instead is just for the testing dependencies file we just have some commands here to go in and find the Django dependency and rip it out and then just you know, use that as a new testing file so that when you run talks, it installs, it has everything specified except Django, which is then specified in the talks.ini file so the two complement each other nicely and you don't end up installing one version, uninstalling it, and just you get the exact version of Django you want to test with. And it, it's not just Django, you can also do this if you're trying to, for example, upgrade from Celery 3 to Celery 4, you want to make sure the app works with both versions, you can have Tox environments for that, and again, strip out that particular dependency and let Tox just control which version you install. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, I guess related to package upgrades, um, what sort of tools or just people watching do you figure out when a package is having another upgrade. I know there's all my changes.com, I forget if it's org com. Then there's like release notes, but how do you track it? This, yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of tools for this and it's something that we mentioned in that OF document, but we didn't actually make a recommendation yet. We're still finalizing that. Uh, there is all my changes.com. It tends to be a little I'm gonna lie about getting the latest versions that are available. Like because four is not until report up too. Yeah, it, it has a little bit of trouble parsing the change logs sometimes. They do a really good job, but it's not perfect. Um, one thing that we're starting to use and are probably gonna do more of is requires.io is a service that lists, so you can give it a repository and we'll go through and analyze its requirements files and its setup.py and it'll list out, give you a, a HTML report of every dependency that's in each file, what version you currently have installed, does it support Python 3 or not? What is the latest version available? Does it support Python 3 or not? <laughs> what license is that package under? So that you can go through and check and see, especially it'll indicate if the license changed between the version you're at and the new version. So you can be aware of that before you go and upgrade it automatically. And it'll also have an indication if there are any known security vulnerabilities in the version of the package you're currently on. So that's a pretty nice one. It can generate pull requests for you it doesn't yet integrate nicely with pip tools, which is one of the reasons we haven't switched over to it fully yet, but it does have some kind of webhook integration. So we're probably gonna be investigating that more in the near future. There are other options also. There's Gymnasium, which recently I believe got acquired by GitLab, so it's more like their thing now. GitHub is starting something to work on this, but it's not actually out for Python yet. Um, right now for Python requires IO, I think is one of the better choices. There was one called version I, which is shut in the process of shutting down. But the source code for it is still there if you want to have something you can run in-house. 
pi up to go? Pi up to IO is another one. It's that one's more focused on generating pull requests for you as opposed to like getting a report online the last time I looked at it. But again, it, it can be very useful for that. Yep. Is that on this topic? Or? Yeah, on the on, yeah. on this topic real quick. Um, I use one called libraries.io. Oh, sorry. Is this, this, yeah, okay. I use one called libraries.io, yeah. which I think is more language independent. Um, mm -hmm. I think, um, and then there's also uh, the, the, the Python library that has been handy for you. Um, there's one user work called pip-rot. Um, which will actually, it will basically tell you how outdated, it's, a, it's not a service, it's something you have to run manually, but if you've got a make file, you can automate it. Um, and it'll tell you how outdated all of your dependencies are, <laughs> like how, how many hundreds of days since. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, I'll show you. I had a totally outdated question. No, it's fine. I think we're done with this topic for now. Great, so I have heard that certain things like PyTC, you could keep updated because if there's a time zone change, that, so I guess, how would you, ha if you want to actively not freeze the requirement, you want to have it auto-update, how would, how does that mesh with something, with this setup? Then you can effectively repurpose this same uh, technique here. You can just delete that dependency from in there, or you can just basically strip out that line and replace it with the generic PyTC. Uh, so there are things that just using pip compile like, doesn't do ideally. There's still some bugs in it. You kind of sometimes have to work around. We have, in some of our repositories, a script for post-processing the requirements file generated by pip compile in order to handle horror level porn cases like that. Uh, in general, I think you're better off just like, having a regular schedule for like, doing the updates, and you'll notice when a new version of PyTC is available. But, yeah, you really want to make sure that just that's always the absolute latest version. Whether or not you have the delayed plate, you can do a workaround for that. Uh, this is somewhere between a question and, and recommendation, or it's a question disguised as a recommendation. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the things, so I've both swung a lot in the Django Python world and in the Ruby world and worked with Bundler in the Ruby world, which is very much like that pip in n. Yep. One of the things that I've seen there, and I also think there's a potential risk here, is that uh, people just check in the, uh, the top level file, and they don't check in the resulting file with the detailed um, requirements. And the problem you run into with that is that if you try to um, get back to a previous release, um, you're not getting the same release that you just had um, because it'll get upgraded. Um, so, uh, does that make sense? I think so. They don't check in the lock file. Yeah, they don't check in the lock file, essentially. Well, at least the way that the uh, pip tools work, if you don't check in basically the alpha file, the lock file, it doesn't upgrade it at all. You're not even running that version. Uh, the whole process tool that we have around only looks at the alpha requirements files. So in that case, basically, what you've done is you failed to upgrade the package at all, even for your tests. Just nothing is going to look at that file. So it tends to get caught fairly quickly, because you go to make the change. It's like, wait a minute, that didn't fix my problem. Why? Oh, I forgot to regenerate the output files. And I think that's also something that, because of that, I think it's something that people tend to catch relatively early on. And yeah, sometimes they forget, but then the next time, they, they start to remember. Uh, we could probably come up with some better tooling and ways to remind people of that. But in practice, we haven't hit that being an issue yet, other than, oh crap, I forgot to generate the files. I think the problem with things like pip and the bundler is more of like, they if you have something in the input file, it will like automatically rebuild the lock or something. Hmm. Or is it just looking at the, Yeah, I mean, basically, the, 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 the sort of the orientation, um, the, the thing that's a little bit weird about this process is basically you're creating a file that is a build product, yep. and a lot of people have in the mindset that they should only check in the files that are mm -hmm. human generated and not the build products. Right. Um, and so if you have that mindset, you need to let go of that mindset and realize that it's important to check in this automatically generated file. So, because you can, you can set up your build environment so that it will generate that file. Um, as part of the process of doing a deploy or something like that, and you will end up hating yourself um, if you do that. So. <laughs>
So I have a question, not directly related to the package dependencies, but when you were showing all the fun stuff in setup.py, um, do you have any good resources or go-to places for um, better specifying classifiers in the setup.py? I know it's not quite directly related to package management, but like the environment markers or? The environment markers, right, and the classifiers, it's like, you know, this version of that, that version of the other, if there's mm -hmm. anything that helps to um, create a better set of classifiers. Okay. Um, the environment markers are something that are really only starting to get used recently, and generally the advice is that you don't need to put it in unless you actually need it. So it tends to be, well, as an example, 
Uh, we've had some cases where we've installed a package and uh, pip compile will go ahead and generate an output file that says, okay, well, you, this thing says it needs that version, so I've been sticking it in there. But then you actually go to install it in another environment, and it's like, oh, that package doesn't work on Python 3. The reason pip put it in is because, pip compile put it in is because it was on a Python 2 system, system that was being run, and it didn't bother carrying through the uh, environment marker that was in the set of the pi file. So in that case, we actually put it in the input file with the environment marker, and then that does get propagated out through the file. But yeah, generally, if you're installing something that you know you only need on a particular operating system, or that you know, you know doesn't work with a particular Python version, is only needed, of course, like a back port of a Python 3 library. So you can put an environment marker there of only install this on Python versions below this one where it's now in the standard library. Um, and in terms of guides, I think there's some documentation in the uh, Python packaging user guide about using environment markers, and there's definitely some just tips about how it works in a handful of PEPs, like PEP 496 and I don't think 881, the other ones. Um, but there's not a lot of good guidance and documentation on environment markers yet, partially because they're a new enough thing that not a lot of people are paying attention. And in terms of just other like inequalities and what Windows tricks something and set it up high, again, like only if you have to. Like if you know that something doesn't work because you have a bug with it, just go ahead and set your range of versions such that it pulls it out. Anyone else? Kind of a question? It's not. like if you're dealing with different Python versions like preferred we I don't know, we discovered and started using PyN fairly recently ish uh, mostly to get away from the hell that is dealing with system installs and your versions of Python and the fact that you might have the PIP2 and PIP3 executables because so that is not a thing you want to do ever. Um, is there any Anything I, I'm thinking about continuous integration because it's the environment in which you might want to actually have the multiple Python versions present and do your testing separately. Um, and that the, the question is: Is there any open-ended comment on that, <laughs> or or you just recommendation like PyN versus Anaconda or something? Um, yeah, I tried using PyN, but I partially just. Probably didn't spend enough time on it, but it, it tended to hit little cases of like it just didn't seem to be working right and different things were through. What I usually do when I need to try different Python versions is we set up talks for tests and then I just reuse the talks environments if I need to do other development tasks with a particular Python version because they're already built them for me, they're there, and I can just recycle that. Talks has that in Python. Yeah, so Py talks just basically creates virtual environments for you and you don't have to access them through talks. You can just do dot dot talks slash my environment name slash bin slash activate and now you're in that virtual environment or a particular Python version, a particular Django version, and you can run any of the normal scripts you need to from there. And I found that to be a little better than trying to remember like which version my main development environment is currently on with yeah. a single it gets a little confusing. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. So we will take uh, five minutes and have uh, let uh, Aaron get uh, set up. So if anyone needs to go use like facilities down the hall to the left. So does the bridge. So does the bridge. Oh.